Hello everyone, this is going to be 11.4, Reformers in the White House, and we're going to look at three major reformers uh, during this time. We're going to look at Taft, Wilson, and Roosevelt. Not in that order, because I forgot to put them in that order. So, we're going to start with a uh, quote from Woodrow Wilson, one of the three major uh, reformer uh, presidents of this time period, progressive presidents, uh, who said, if you want to make enemies, try and change something. And Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson all made enemies, that's for sure. Our objectives, we're going to analyze how Teddy Roosevelt influenced the changing relationship between the federal government and private businesses, explain the impact of his actions towards managing the environment, compare and contrast Roosevelt's policies with Taft and Wilson's, and then we're going to describe Wilson's efforts to regulate the economy and lastly assess the whole legacy of the progressive era, uh, which ended, but... Did it end? We'll talk about that. So, let's look at Roosevelt and business during this time. So, in 1901, William McKinley, uh, who had just won his second term as President of the United States, was shot uh, at a World's Fair in Buffalo, New York, by a man named Leon Chogosh. Uh, and Leon Chogosh assassinated him because he was an anarchist. He was against all forms of government, violently so. And so uh, McKinley's vice president, Teddy Roosevelt, took over. Roosevelt had already done a lot. Uh, we'll find out in 11.5 uh, what he did during the Spanish-American War. He was young, he was energetic, he was forceful, loud, almost a walking cartoon character in a way. Uh, and he would become the first of three largely progressive, reform-minded presidents that we have in the White House in a row. So here's our 26th president, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, president from 1901 to 1909, meaning he won his own uh, presidential term in his own right. He is from New York, from New York City, actually. Uh, he is a former New York assemblyman. He was the uh, assistant secretary of the Navy, governor of New York after the Spanish-American War, and vice president of the United States uh, before uh, becoming president after the assassination. Uh, he was also America's youngest president. Uh, he was only 42 when he became president. Uh, he is not our youngest elected president. That would be John F. Kennedy. But he was our youngest president when he uh, assumed the presidency after McKinley's death. Uh, he's also the first president we had to win the Nobel Peace Prize. We've had several now. So, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, who is this guy? He came from a very wealthy New York family, uh, went to Harvard, very well educated. Uh, he had had really bad asthma as a kid, and a lot of doctors actually assumed that he would not make it past his younger years. Uh, but he did. He exercised heavily trying to get through uh, his life. Uh, after Harvard, he got married, went into politics, became a New York State Assemblyman. Uh, however, his first wife and his mother both died on the same day, February 14th. Um, and uh, after this, in mourning, Roosevelt went out west uh, and lived as a rancher for several years. And this meant that he came to really love the outdoors and hunting and uh, natural sciences and things like that. Um, so here's a young Teddy Roosevelt who once said, I'm not a good shot, but I shoot often. Uh, however, after a few years, Roosevelt came back to New York, uh, where he worked as the police commissioner for the New York City uh, Police Department, uh, then was promoted up to assistant secretary of the Navy. However, when the Spanish-American War broke out, we'll get to that next uh, section, uh, Roosevelt quit the uh, secretary of the Navy job to go fight uh, in Cuba. After this, he became what was known as a rough rider. Uh, the popularity that he received from being a rough rider during the war helped make him governor of New York and later vice president. Uh, Republican bosses who didn't like Roosevelt, they, they didn't like his progressive policies, they thought he was a bit of a, a troublemaker, basically. Uh, Republican bosses hoped that his career would die uh, in the vice presidency. Instead, it was McKinley who passed away, and Roosevelt took his place. So, as a president, Roosevelt was famous for uh, being a favorite of journalists. Like I said, he was almost a walking cartoon character. Um, uh, he, he was very popular among muckrakers. Uh, he was popular among many other people. Um, he uh, had the teddy bear named after him, actually, uh, after a uh, hunting trip where he refused to shoot a baby bear. 
Uh, Roosevelt also was popular among progressives and reformers. Uh, he set up what he called the Square Deal. Uh, the Square Deal was a set of political initiatives uh, meant to uh, keep the wealthy from becoming too wealthy and powerful uh, and the, help out the poor a little bit. Uh, and he did this through what he called the three C's, conservation, consumer protection, and corporation control. Uh, so he hoped to not necessarily be full-on socialist, but at least give a better chance to the poor of America. So here's Roosevelt refusing to kill a bear cub. This is the story that got him the nickname of the teddy bear. And this is a, the replica of the original teddy bear. Um, and when you say the square deal, Roosevelt put it this way. He said, when I believe in a square deal, I say, uh, I do not mean to give every man the best hand. If good cards do not come to any man, or if they do come and he is not in the power to play them, that is his affair. Uh, all I mean is that there shall be no crookedness in the dealing. So, um, not necessarily make all people equal uh, paid or something like that, but at least make the dealing a little more fair. So let's look at those three C's. Uh, first, Roosevelt uh, and the federal government. Uh, Roosevelt believed that the federal government should have a lot of power and that the president should be incredibly powerful. Um, he is almost Jacksonian in the idea of, you know, the president being not just a figurehead, but the leader of an entire country. Uh, and he really thought that the government had the power to intervene in big business. Uh, one example of this was in 1902 when coal miners went on strike uh, and uh, it was getting cold and people needed coal to burn to heat their houses. And so after negotiations fell through, Roosevelt basically said, if you coal miners don't go back to work, I'm going to put the federal troops in the mines and they can mine for coal while you guys stand out there. The importance of this was the government had actually gotten involved in labor. Um, the old-style laissez-faire government of don't mess with labor would never have done that. But Roosevelt was willing to jump in, basically, uh, and really angered some people by the fact that he was getting involved in big business. Uh, Roosevelt went on to create two new uh, departments, or one department that would later split into two, which is the Department of Commerce and Labor, uh, which would later become the Department of Commerce and the Department of Labor, uh, so that the federal government could keep an eye on big businesses, uh, especially businesses exchange, uh, engaged in interstate commerce. If you recall from Chapter 9, we had the Interstate Commerce Commission, but they didn't really have any power quite yet. Not until Roosevelt. Now, like we said, railroads were a big issue. They could charge basically whatever they wanted. They um, generally favored big businesses and heavily taxed uh, the smaller businesses and the family farms. Uh, and back in the 80s, the ICC, the Interstate Commerce Commission, was created to cut down on these unfair practices. But it didn't really work until Roosevelt passed the Hepburn Act. Uh, which gave the ICC the power to um, set these shipping rates. So again, we see that Roosevelt's in favor of the federal government uh, cracking down on big business if necessary. Roosevelt also got a reputation as what we would call a trust buster, uh, which means that if Roosevelt saw a monopoly, he believed that the federal government and the federal courts had the right to tear apart this monopoly uh, in order to make sure that uh, unfair business practices weren't being performed. However, Roosevelt didn't believe that all trusts were bad. All, he didn't believe that all monopolies were bad. He believed that there were certain bad monopolies and good monopolies. Um, and so he wanted to get rid of the bad ones. Many progressives uh, thought that his belief in good and bad trusts didn't go far enough. Uh, a lot of uh, progressives thought that uh, any sort of monopoly is inherently bad. So here's Roosevelt killing the bad trusts, but letting the good trusts live. Uh, he also went on to regulate food and drugs. So in 1906, Upton Sinclair wrote a book called The Jungle, which was 
big and sort of broad epic story of a family living through the Gilded Age. Um, the part that pe caught people's attention, though, was the part that was set in um, meat packing plants and how gross they were and, you know, fingers getting cut off and put into hot dog meat and rats falling in and, and poo falling into the, the hot dog meat and stuff like that, too. That really got people really grossed out. Um, in response to this, uh, Roosevelt read it and was actually quite moved by it. Uh, Roosevelt passed the Meat Inspection Act, which gave the federal government the power to inspect meat, to grade it, uh, and to pull it off the shelves if it was too bad to be eaten by the people. So here is, uh, here's some folks inspecting meat right here. Now, let's also look at the environment, conservation. Roosevelt loved nature for many reasons. He loved to be out in nature. He was also a hunter. He was, uh, um, he was a naturalist, meaning that he liked to uh, collect specimens and put them in his own museums. Uh, he liked to shoot things, too. He was a hunter. Uh, he definitely admired uh, John Muir, who was a Scottish-born naturalist. Muir was uh, famous for living in Yosemite National Park, uh, and Muir helped to get the national park created in 1890. So here's John Muir on the right, standing with Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, Muir was alive from 1838 to 1914. Uh, he was born in Scotland, but came to America as a teenager. He was an author and a naturalist and a preservationist. We'll get to the difference between preservation and conservation in a minute. He also helped to found the Sierra Club to preserve America's nature, and for a time lived in a one-room cabin in Yosemite uh, with a creek actually running through the middle of it so he could hear uh, the creek going and he could drink fresh water out of the creek every morning. Uh, Muir once said, I'd rather be in the mountains thinking of God than in a church thinking about the mountains. Now, Muir believed in the preservation of wild nature, that the wild, beautiful areas of America should remain untouched. They should not be used. Uh, their natural resources should be left alone. This idea is called preservation. Roosevelt believed more in conservation, which is the idea we need to save some of the land, especially the beautiful parts like the Grand Canyon and Yosemite and Yellowstone. However, the parts with natural resources should be used. Uh, carefully and sparingly, uh, and we should replant trees in order to make sure that our natural resources don't fully go away. Um, the head of the U.S. Forestry Commission and a personal friend of Roosevelt's was a guy named Gifford Pinchot, and Pinchot also believed that. Gifford Pinchot believed that we should allow the forests to grow out uh, and that future generations would be able to use them after that as well. So here's Gifford Pinchot who said, the purpose of conservation is the greatest good to the greatest number of people for the longest time. Now, during Roosevelt's time in office, he created five national parks and a lot of other national preserves and wildlife sanctuaries as well. Um, Roosevelt also believed that the federal government uh, should be able to protect the environment, uh, even on private property, if it meant doing the greatest good. So he created a lot of like bird sanctuaries and wildlife sanctuaries, uh, making sure that um, certain uh, species did not go extinct. Um, and this a whole idea of that the U.S. government can step in and protect wildlife on private property is still very controversial because it kind of goes up against the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment says, you know, you have a right to your own private property, uh, but it also says the federal government can step in if it feels that they have the right to use it better. Um, so this is still very controversial up through today. Uh, Roosevelt also worried about big companies forming trusts to uh, claim water out west, um, where water is, was and still is very precious as a resource. Just ask anybody in California, Arizona, New Mexico, or Colorado. Um, so Roosevelt passed the National Reclamation Act, which gave the federal government the right to decide how we're going to use water and when we're going to use it. Uh, the government could also build dams and build big reservoirs as well. So here, for example, is the Hetch Hetchy Dam uh, in Yosemite Valley. Uh, this used to be Hetch Hetchy Valley until it was flooded to provide drinking water for San Francisco. Uh, John Muir 
uh, argued loudly for the preservation of Hetch Hetchy Valley, but Gifford Pinchot said, the most good for the most people, let's flood Hetch Hetchy Valley, turn it into a reservoir so that people can drink water. Now, let's look at uh, the new direction in presidential politics here. Uh, Roosevelt left office after his uh, second term in 1909. Uh, however, he was still incredibly powerful, and he still had a large voice, and uh, he basically pointed at his Secretary of War, William Howard Taft, and said, that's the nominee we're going to put in. And that's what happened. William Howard Taft was elected partially uh, due to the popularity of his friend Teddy Roosevelt. So Roosevelt expected William Howard Taft to basically be Roosevelt Part 2, Roosevelt 2.0, basically, when he became president. So here's our 27th president, William Howard Taft, president from 1909 and 1913. He was from Ohio. He was a former judge, uh, the governor of the Philippine Islands, uh, governor of Cuba, military governor, uh, and the former secretary of war. Uh, he was also our largest president we ever had. He was over 350 pounds. Uh, he's also the only president we've ever had that became the head of another branch when he was done being president. He became Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So here is uh, the famous story is that uh, William Howard Taft had a bathtub installed in the uh, White House that was big enough for four regular sized men. So this is Taft's Taft tub, I guess you might say. Anyway, Taft was much more progressive than Roosevelt in some ways. For instance, he was a pure trust buster. He wanted to get rid of all monopolies, not just what were considered the bad ones. Uh, Taft was also in favor of lowering tariffs. Uh, however, he did not lower them as much as Roosevelt wanted him to. Uh, the biggest misstep, though, was uh, Taft got into a fight with the, with the U.S. Forestry Service and the De Department of the Interior, the people who handle our natural resources, and he fired Gifford Pinchot. Um, and in general, Taft just was not the president that Teddy Roosevelt hoped he would be. So Taft had a long four years in office with Roosevelt sort of, you know, shouting at him the entire time. Uh, there's a famous political cartoon of William Howard Taft dressed up as Teddy Roosevelt, uh, trying to be Roosevelt, but the clothes just don't fit. Now, in response to uh, Taft's time in office, Roosevelt decided that maybe he did want a third tar term, which was still legal at this point. Uh, and so in 1912, uh, after the Republicans nominated Taft again, Roosevelt left the Republican Party and founded, and helped found at least, the Progressive Party, uh, most famously known as the Bull Moose Party, because Roosevelt once said, I feel as strong as a bull moose. Uh, and Roosevelt ran against both the Republicans and the Democrats in Woodrow Wilson. Uh, after Roosevelt left the Republicans to do this, he took a large number of Republicans with him, basically split the party down the middle. So in the middle of all this, by the way, Teddy Roosevelt was shot in the chest while giving a speech. Um, luckily, the bullet went through uh, his speech and it went through his glasses case before hitting his chest. But Roosevelt spoke for over an hour after being shot. At one point, he tore open his jacket, showing the wound in his chest and saying, it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Roosevelt is terrifying. So here, by the way, is his bulletproof speech. Now, Taft and Roosevelt split the Republican Party uh, in two with their feud. Uh, when Roosevelt left, he took half the Republicans with him. Uh, this was great news for the Democrats because basically you have two parties, two small parties running against one big party. The one big party is going to win. Uh, and so they ran Woodrow Wilson, who was a progressive Democrat, uh, and he used the split in the Republican Party uh, to win the election of 1812. Roosevelt, uh, or I'm sorry, Wilson campaigned on what was called New Freedom. Uh, he wanted regulation over big businesses, opportunities for smaller businesses, continued progressivism, basically. So here's our 28th president, Woodrow Wilson, who was president from 1913 to 1921. Uh, though he was born in Virginia, he lived his adult life in New Jersey, where he was the president of Princeton University uh, and the former governor of New Jersey. Uh, he actually suffered a stroke while he was president, uh, which left him quite debilitated, uh, and his wife sort of took over as 
translator and spokesperson for the White House. And so some people found it very difficult to say, who's running the country here? Is it Wilson or is it Mrs. Wilson? Now, Wilson had only won with 41% of the vote, and Roosevelt actually came in second place. This is the only time when the second place finisher was not the Democrats or the Republicans. Uh, Wilson was also the first Southerner to be president since Andrew Johnson right after the Civil War. Now, Wilson was a progressive in many, many ways. Uh, all three of these guys were progressives, even though they came from different political parties. Uh, being a progressive was bipartisan. Wilson also very much believed in the idea of political reform uh, and created a lot of government agencies and laws that are still in use today. So, for instance, uh, Wilson lowered tariffs, uh, lowered taxes on foreign goods, which uh, he hoped would make sure that uh, businesses uh, could not force their consumers to pay unfair prices. Uh, they had competition to worry about, so basically they couldn't raise their prices too high. Wilson also passed the 16th Amendment, which was the graduated income tax that the populists were looking for back in the 1890s. Um, this meant that rich people, rich people paid more taxes than the poor did. Uh, and this, again, is still controversial up through today. Some people say it's, you know, basically punishing the rich for doing well. Other people say it's the price we pay for a functioning society. Uh, Wilson also helped to create the uh, monetary policy, a steady one, which meant that he could control the supply of money in circulation. Uh, and in order to do this, he created a central banking authority run by the U.S. government. This is the first time we've seen this since Andrew Jackson killed the Bank of the United States back in the 1820s and 30s. So Wilson, Wilson got Congress to pass the Federal Reserve Act, which created the U.S. Federal Reserve. Uh, and the Federal Reserve controlled the flow of money through regional banks and set interest rates, including here in St. Louis, Missouri, where I'm recording this right now. Um, the uh, U.S. Federal Reserve has a lot of branches, including the one in downtown St. Louis. So Andrew, uh, Alexander Hamilton is very glad to hear that basically his national bank is back in business. Now, a lot of conservatives were worried about all this progressiveness. Uh, they thought that uh, progressives were putting way too much power into the federal government, uh, which is still considered very uh, controversial today. Um, and so, we, again, we see all these sort of um, progressive presidents had their uh, dissenters, the people who didn't like them, but uh, they also had the people who did very much like them. Wilson, lastly, uh, he created the Federal Trade Commission with the purpose of monitoring business, again, sort of making sure that big trusts didn't happen. Uh, he also created a, an act specifically for antitrust, uh, which was strengthening earlier antitrust legislation by spelling out precisely what businesses could and could not do uh, during this time. This is still very important up through today. Um, and they're still looking after the practices of big businesses up through today. Wilson also passed laws to help the workers, like the Working Men's Compensation Act, which said that if you're sick or if that you're injured in a federal job, you will get paid, you will get time off. Uh, he created the Adamson Act, which said that workers will only work from here on in eight hours a day. Uh, however, he did occasionally side with companies over the workers, too. He was not consistently progressive on every issue. Now, let's look at the legacy of progressivism as well. Here are some of the big lasting legacies of progressivism. First of all, we still have a lot of these things today uh, that give more power to the people in the government. So the initiative, the referendum, the recall, the 17th Amendment, uh, things that uh, allowed regular people to have more power in the government. Uh, we still also see the big antitrust laws and the environmental laws and the natural resources laws. And so all of this is still very much a part of our federal government so we still do see the impact of progressivism in a lot of ways right up through today. For progressives, the idea that big government is a good thing uh, is sort of what they held to, and that uh, the bigger the government, the more problems it can fix. Um, and this was very popular during the progressive era. However, many conservatives are still worried about this progressive method of doing things, worrying that basically the amount of power given to the federal government um, through these was way too much, 
uh, and that uh, we should lessen the power of the federal government if we want to have a freer society. So this is still the debate we're having today.